Pro wrestling up, version of Kokai comes out in order to provide you all the straight and the color that you need in order to keep the cameras rolling and people watching. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Girl on the Fishes podcast. I uh, screwed up. I don't have the uh, the intro this week. I, it's been a hell of a day. My gas heater broke. The car broke. We're late. We barely made it on tonight. But we made it, guys. We're here for you. So we're here. Thanks for coming on. And we have joints. So it's fun. Yeah. So Marty's here with us today with uh, some special guests. Yep. Oh, <laughs> tough guy. <laughs> this is my friend, Kokai. Kokai E. And I'm into something called pro wrestling. So every now and then you're going to hear a couple of cut catchphrases as well as a few references to some obscure 1950s, 1960s, and 1970 matches. Excellent. Wow, dude, you have incredible lung capacity. What are you smoking there, Steve? And guest, mystery guest. Wow, <laughs> I love it. Look at that. <laughs> when you help a lot, help a lot of growers, <laughs> they give you a bag of weed, you know, uh, to tell you if they did a good job or not. So that's what that is. I don't remember. I gotta go back and look at the label. <laughs> How are you guys doing tonight? What's new? Uh, what's new in the grow over there? I saw you're posting some cool pictures of your tomato plants getting restarted oh, yeah. over there. What's going on? Oh yeah. Well, the, the tomatoes are out of control. Basically, they're growing down the aisles at this point. <laughs> um, so they're already over the top of the tree. There's only two, uh, two tomato plants, and they're obviously not. You know, they're obviously indetermined tomatoes because they're just continuing to grow. <laughs> and. I uh, started to uh, pollinate, get tomatoes off of them, which is great. So um, that's the only downside to growing tomatoes inside is you have to hand pollinate them. But I did order some uh, uh, some pirate bugs, which will give us a little traffic and then hopefully get some just passive pollination. <clears throat> Try to get a few more tomatoes out of it. The aureus are great. Uh... For those of you who don't know, minute pirate bugs are uh, also called aureus, is the genus. Um, there's many different genuses depending on where you are. You, I know they, they grow different ones in Europe and Africa than they do in, in North America. Uh, but uh, aureus are great. They're one of the best general um, insect predators, similar to like um, um, lace wings, except they'll eat things that are much larger than lace wings. Um, they can kill stuff that's, you know, 80, 100 times their size. Um, they're also poisonous. Um, you know, they can bite. Um, they can also bite you. They'll leave pretty good welts uh, if they bite you, um, worse than a, your average uh, mosquito. They're big enough to avoid, though. I feel like they're large enough. That you, don't, you know, it's not like you'll accidentally. Like, I've released them and had them around plenty of times and haven't. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever been stung or bit or whatever you call it. Yeah, I've, I've had them. <laughs> I've never had issues working with the grow. I've had been bitten <laughs> releasing them, doing large releases. And I've been bitten uh, doing bucking and harvesting where I'm really harassing the shit out of the plants. And I've been bitten a little bit doing cloning. But even during cloning, you know, you're kind of moving the plants around a little bit. And they, they don't really like movement and all that. So they'll kind of run away. Um, they're, you know, they're kind of more fright averse, cause similar to like wheel bugs. If anyone's ever encountered uh, wheel bugs in the south, uh, dudes look like they have a, a spiky mohawk. Um, again, a really wonderful garden predator, but very um, skittish. You know, won't not very aggressive towards humans. But if you pick them up, you're going to regret it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, which makes sense. <laughs> wow. The other nice thing is uh, they live a long time compared to a lot of other insects. They live almost two to three times longer than a lot of the other beneficials. Right, and because they feed in their adult form, it's not like <laughs> green lace thing, which will. You know their adult form <coughs> doesn't um, isn't predatory. It's just their larvae, so they spend a much shorter time feeding overall than an aureus, which won't consume as many per day, but 
because it's active for so long as an adult, it'll consume more over its whole lifespan. What are y'all talking about? What? I feel like we have, uh, what's the guy from Chappelle show? That also is bald and has a very similar voice to you. I can't remember his. He was just on. Uh, he was just Paul on uh, Rogan a couple of weeks ago, like Paul not Mooney? even that long ago. What's Paul that? Mooney. No, 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 no. Hold on. Who's the other guy. Paul Mooney wrote for the Chappelle show. The, Paul the, Mooney the, did write for him, but he wasn't on his show recently. It was Donald Rawlings. Oh, okay. Donnell sure. Rawlings. You remind me of Donnell Rawlings. That's who it is. Thank you. you sound like him. You sound a lot like him, except you have much nicer uh, facial hair. Right, facial yeah, hair okay, your yeah, facial hair is far more impressive. We're okay. talking about bugs that eat other bugs. Okay. Yes. So, so, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. forgive me for mm-hmm. asking, Kurt. So, because we're talking <coughs> about plants and you guys are indoor, why are we talking about bugs? So, well, because they're a huge part of <coughs> growing indoors because there's no predators. So, once one gets in, the population will just explode because there's in year round it's the perfect temperature for them so they have the food and everything they need and nothing to eat them so any of your common garden pests that'll just come in like on your clothes or on your pet or anywhere else will they'll explode in population really quick wow so i know history and that sounds like squirrels (laughs) in north america and then you're gonna grow something called corn which they love. <laughs> and then they come afar because you cut down the forest and there's no owls, no birds, nothing to eat the squirrels. So what you just tell me was you created an ideal situation indoor for and the perfect food for these bugs to <laughs> eat. Right. So- and then you got to deal with maintaining them by coming up with the balance of another bug predator? Yes. So we we release predators indoors that will eat anything that's in there. And you do, you almost every indoor grower has, you know, bug concerns at best. Usually you get some at some point, you can't grow indoors for very long and not encounter them. Especially if you're bringing in plants from outside from other people's grows. Because <clears throat> these bugs are everywhere, like in your front yard, your house plants. You just don't care because it's your house plant. It's you're not smoking it or eating it. Yeah. So, for those who don't know who I am, um, <clears throat> I don't know nothing. <laughs> so this may be a one-on-one. Well, or, you grew a garden this year. No, I did grow a garden this year, but this may be a one-on-one session for those who are long-term viewers <laughs> of this channel, I apologize in advance, but everything that I'm about to demonstrate over the next hour with my two friends is authentic. I don't know nothing. If I did know something, I wouldn't be smoking other people's weed. I'd be smoking my weed. Am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> True. I mean, you, you probably still smoke some of mine, but we yeah, were, yeah, we yeah, yeah. Each other's weed. C- true, true right. indeed, true indeed. Because the last stuff that you shared with me came with some strap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was good. Everyone oh, needs good. to have a uranium glass ashtray, by the way. Uranium. Yes, uranium, uranium glass. glass. Old school. It's an old forties ashtray. Wow. Wow. That's um. Good. Anyways, uh. So somebody asked in chat, it says, aren't wheel bugs also called assassin bugs or am I mistaken? So wheel bugs and aureus are actually both types of assassin bugs. So they're right. both in the assassin bug family. Um, the assassin bugs actually covers a huge range of insects, including um, both uh, uh, bugs um, that um, feed on insects as well as ones that feed on plant saps. So you got to be careful when you're... Uh, you know, just because it looks like an assassin bug doesn't mean it's not a leaf foot bug or some other uh, insect in that family that might actually predate on your plant. So um, this is why it's important about IDing the, the right insect. I know when Marty and I teach our IPM class, we have some side-by-side examples of, you know, some predatory thrips and non-predatory thrips and shield bugs versus and shield beetles versus uh, which are predatory versus uh, stink bugs and that aren't predatory and all that. So 
um, definitely something to uh, uh, think about if you're if you're looking for further education uh, on that. But this is something that we you know we highly emphasize is that you really do need to know uh, about, about your local insects in order to have a good um, experience growing because you might accidentally think you have a really bad infestation or think you have two or three insects attacking your plant when in fact only one of them is feeding on your plant actively. Um, so another great example of this would be if you have spider mites, okay? So say I, I find spider mites, but I also find thrips in my, in my grow. Well, treat the spider mites first because the thrips um, depending on what pest control agent you're going to, you will also be affected by the same pest control agent, or in many cases, uh, in fact, most species of thrips that actually predate cannabis are omnivores. They're actually not herbivores. Um, so they'll actually predate actively on baby thrips, uh, 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 you know, of other species, as well as mites. So they'll eat spider mites. They'll eat uh, russet mites. They'll, they'll, it, it, again, they're not going to solve your problem. They're not a solution, but you know, treating the mites first and allowing them to help you eliminate them before you treat them as well, and maybe treat them a week later or treat them not as aggressively, uh, you know, might be a good uh, a solution depending on the level of infestation, what the stage of growth. Um, so, uh, you know, or again, like we were talking about before, you know, just thrips, 34% of thrip species are actually predators, not plant predators. So, um, you know, just because you find an insect on your plant doesn't mean it's hurting your plant. You know, look for damage on the plant, look for egg laying on the plant, look for uh, webbing on the plant, you know, look for those types of things. Also, you know, there's other ones as well. Uh, leaf hoppers, for example, can spread viruses, um, you know, from other plants. You know, we're seeing that quite a bit in the West now with uh, mosaic viruses and leaf curl viruses coming in on multiple, from multiple crops, cucumbers, nightshades, beets, all jumping to cannabis, you know, and, and, and it's because you're getting white fly and, and, and leaf hopper, which are at least suspected right now, uh, being the vectors. So uh, just because they're not even feeding on your plant doesn't mean they're not screwing your plants up. So it's, you got to really be out in your garden, you know, every day, every other day and taking samples, you know, regularly sampling leaves, scouting leaves, and, uh, you know, really trying to understand uh, local ecology as well as, you know, go around the property outside of your grow and, and understand what insects are outside. I know last year I was working on a grow and we could, we could, we could beat back our root aphids and they disappear for a week or two. And then suddenly they would explode again. Uh, and we couldn't figure out where the hell they were coming from because we could exterminate them out of the building but they would just reappear and it wasn't in the moms it, you know we couldn't figure out where the hell it was coming from when we look the pond on the property had tons of lily aphids and in fact they weren't rice root aphids they're actually water lily aphids but um you know but they look almost identical under a microscope you know without dna testing you can't really know but um so they were just coming back in you know from airborne through the ventilation or some other gap in the wall uh, and, and, and reinfecting us that way, at least that client. So we ended up doing some uh, uh, treating the, the, the pond with some beneficial sprays and stuff like that uh, and putting some beneficial um, uh, uh, stuff out there and eliminating them outside. And then we stopped having them come back inside and then it you know, solved the problem. So sometimes looking around, even around the environment around your grow uh, can also help uh, eliminate some of these issues or at least reoccurring issues that you can't quite put your finger on. I also had another grower uh, recently send me a, a highly experienced grower in aquaponic cannabis, one of the people I trained early on. Um, and uh, all of his water parameters were right. All of his pest control, all, you know, every environmental factor was, was right. It's a genetics they've been doing for a long time. And here they had a, a, a root issue with uh, 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 someone introducing some issues with the roots uh, from a new soil mix they had. So, um, uh, you know, just because they were out of it because of, you know, uh, the, the virus causing so much issues with uh, transport these days, um, they had to switch temporarily to a different soil mix that happened to vector in something that they weren't expecting, right? So, uh, but it was attacking the root system. So this, this is where, you know, knowing your plants, knowing the timelines they should have, and then knowing any yellowing or, uh, uh, you know, and all that stuff on the schedule also is super important, but also why it's important just to be in your grow every day to day, you know, and be able to make these types of observations so that when you do make a minor variable change, you, you immediately can, can notice these things. And it's something that I think a lot of people don't do. In fact, I've I've seen some, I know, I've consulted on some girls recently where they went away for the holidays and came back and, you know, it was just a, a, an absolute shit show. And they had three males that had pollinated the whole room over Christmas. So you got to be careful. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, 
obviously it's going to be better to have eyes on it more often than not. Um, and uh, I, I can't imagine like not being in my room at least every day. I mean, that just seems like uh, that seems like not much work to me, actually. Or at least at least some maintain. type of at least some type of remotely educated human, right? Even if it's not you, you know, some worker on the Sunday or something. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, like uh, just a relatively experienced set of eyes is really all you need. Because you know, or even a lot of times when I go in there, I'll be able to hear something isn't quite right. You know, like the uh, uh, siphons taking too long to kick off like it should have already ran or um you know you can hear uh water flowing differently uh or maybe you've noticed the fish tank is lower or higher than it normally is um you know just eyes that have been in there before and know what to expect and that's something i think that it, it often to me is one of the first things i notice when i walk into a grow is the smell and the sound you know, if, especially if I'm used to the grow, I can immediately tell if there's an air pump that's off, if there's a water pump that's off, because you get used to the sound, you get used to the sounds on, and the cycle of the sounds, the same way you get used to nature and then suddenly it's too quiet, or it's too loud or something else, the same way you'd, you know, notice an, a predator walking towards you in the forest or something like that. You know, it's the same kind of thing uh, you, you notice in the grow where you can walk in and, and immediately, uh, um, you know, tell something is wrong or, or even smells. I know when I used to work in the pet trade, uh, I could smell a single, you know, dead reptile over the entire smell of the whole store just because it was such a, you know, I just wasn't one of the usual cacophony of smells, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so we had a, a question in chat. It says biologic, uh, where is it? How's the Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe project going? Um, Zimbabwe project has been... Uh, uh, on hold, um, especially right now, the, the country is currently as of what, two days ago, two days ago? on days full, ago. yeah, two days ago, full lockdown, you can't go more than five kilometers from your house unless it's for a real good reason. Um, so we, we've, I, I, I left there in April. Um, we'll be back sometime this year, fingers crossed. Uh, I got projects there, South Africa, Mauritius, Reunion. Uh, we're going to be going to some really cool places this year if everything uh, uh, works out with the travel stuff. Uh, um, we have some projects coming up now. Uh, and later At the end of this month, they'll be out in Georgia. Uh, so working on a hemp grow, so that'll be fun. We'll be doing some video out there. Um, so excited about that. And then we have some, some other stuff uh, uh, coming up. Uh, again, it's going to just depend on travel restrictions and, uh, and all that jazz. But... Um, I'm kind of tired of uh, sitting in one place. I haven't sat in one place this long <laughs> in about four or five years, and it's weird. <laughs> you were right in like Southern Cali. What's that? Colorado before that. Colorado before you were at Southern Cali because you were you kind of bounced around Southern California for a little bit. But I was in SoCal. I was in NorCal. I was in. Uh, so probably Colorado, Colorado she were really then, no, Tulsa and then now we're down down in southern Oklahoma these days and then uh, just all mm. over again um, and then we got a bunch of projects on the east coast I'll be working on this year which would be kind of nice get a chance to see my family a little more a few more times this year than I normally do so that'll be dope right. and then uh, yeah just really kind of wondering when this international shit's going to be Buddy up, um, you know, get back up to Canada. I got some two different people to work with up there once this virus shit is over with. And uh, yeah, just I have a ton of work really just waiting on the ability to travel. Right. Um, so, and then yeah, just the, the industry is really growing right now. There's a lot of new aquaponic cannabis producers, a lot, a lot of larger producers. I know the certainly the scale, a lot of the people that are. I've talked to in the last six months has been, you know, quite a big step up from, from the people I've spoken to previously and, uh, um, you know, people's willingness to, to invest in, in larger aquaponic cannabis uh, facilities has uh, definitely gone up uh, uh, considerably. So um, definitely uh, uh, an exciting year. And then uh, we have the, the class we've been working on. Uh, I know we've, I've been working on um, drafting up some of the new content and, and some new, some additional handouts and stuff for that. 
I'm working on a couple of new SketchUp diagrams to go with some of the existing content. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, I guess, the other stuff I've been up to. And then just uh, working on our drinks. We have the drink company we're working on out here uh, in Oklahoma. So we'll be uh, uh, talking about more of that one that's a little more evenly distributed across the, the, uh, the state of Oklahoma, um, which will be here in a few weeks. Awesome. Um, feel free to ask real questions in chat, guys. We've had a kind of a, we yeah. had a, another guest originally planned for tonight, and then uh, we had a backup guest, and then uh, both of them fell through. The last, I, I was about five minutes late, and everyone fell through, so we ended up uh, kind of just rolling with it. We said we were doing a show tonight, so we're just like, screw it, let's do it. All right, so we have another question. Uh, how do we, do we rely on wicking for both flower and veg and aquaponics, or is there water frequency we follow or dry backs and flower that are recommended? Example, holding back on first or last watering. Um, okay, so I guess first off, um, while you can do wicking bed flour for, for aquaponic cannabis, it is much harder. Um, I have not been able to find the right soil mix that allows me to not have issues and it, uh, the last one to two weeks of flower. And that's been always the issue with wicking beds is that the last one to two weeks of flower, um, I end up with drooping on the plant and some type of root issue because the plant's just, you know, terminating the use of a lot, the, the, the very ends of its root system and the aquaponic system because it has all the types of microbes that like to break stuff down, starts breaking it down. Um, so it ends up starting to, to affect the roots. So that's the problem I've had the, the couple of different times we've tried to do aquaponic um, wicking beds. Um, I've tried it a couple of different ways uh, and, and have just not had very good luck. Uh, but with the dual root zones, um, yes, we do use dual root zones for both. Uh, frequency of watering, definitely, uh, if you want to increase production in flower, um, definitely can, um, uh, you know, help by, by allowing the plants that, that if, if you have the ability to, with, say, a loop siphon or a timer, absolutely, if you can dry the uh, increase the flood cycles uh, and make them longer uh, at the end of flower and dry the plants out a little bit they will do a little bit better uh, in terms of resin production but i mean it's kind of a minuscule thing and and when you're doing it at scale it's not really worth the, the hassle and you know it's, it, it's just not worth it but if you're going to min max it especially in a smaller grow uh, you know it, it definitely is a uh, something that you can do hey steve yeah. Can you real quick explain uh, to Kokai what a wicking bed is? Please. Because you just went detail. You guys went like two, three deep, you know, inches deep like Ralph Nader. And I'm like, okay, that was an inbound pass. And I was like, what? So uh, a wicking bed is um, uh, having the plants just sit in kind of a wet soil with water that flows through the bottom. Um, and basically can constantly sip out of, they also called SIPs, if, if you're familiar with that, or sub-irrigated planter systems, um, where the water is, is, comes up from the bottom and they're never really top watered, maybe, maybe the first time, and then that's about it, um, just to get the roots to penetrate down into that lower root zone. Um, but once they find the moisture down there, then they're pretty good. The problem is, is that, again, you, it, unless it's got really good at gas exchange and air exchange, it's easy to, to get anaerobic and uh, get quite toxic down there. And uh, that makes sense. That's the problem. A lot of sense. Soil stays wet all the time. Right. 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 There's so unless you full drainage. So unless you're inoculating with the right microbes and you're doing everything right, then uh, uh, definitely is an issue. Right. Can be done. Just I think technically more work, in my opinion, than what we're talking yeah. about. Dual root zone. You yeah. Do you want to explain that? dual root zone? I yeah. I got to step off for two seconds. All right, yeah, I can do that. <clears throat> so dual root zone basically is um, instead of having the soil all the way down to the point where it touches the water and is constantly wicking water up, that's what they call it, a wicking bed. Oh, okay, like a wick, gotcha. <laughs> right. now wicking up like a wick. Right. So it's wicking water up from the bottom with the soil itself. So in a dual root zone, we lift the soil up higher so that, um, you know, we just use media like those clay pellets mm -hmm. that I have, or mm -hmm. standing clay, or lava rock, or all you know, all those different ones, um, or go in the bottom in, in a separator, usually like burlap, or I've been using, I've used straw, or all, all kinds of different 
experimenting with different stuff, chop horse tail fern, like just you just need the separator to keep the soil from soaking down into the media and wicking up. You want the soil to stay separate so it doesn't constantly stay wet. It'll only be wet when you water it, when you want to water it. So it doesn't constantly stay wet and have that problem. And it allows you to put a higher concentration of nutrients inside the pot um, that won't get into the same water system as the fish. So the fish can't handle higher levels of potassium or phosphorus. The leaching that comes and down leach from, gotcha, the water system. gotcha. Yeah. And actually, there's a cool article that came out today. Hold on, let me pull it up here. Actually do some screen share. Um, 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 um. And then I, 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 I got a couple of questions about the Zimbabwe groves, because I don't know anything and I'm kind of interested though. Sure. This is courtesy of Luna. Hold on, I'll get it right. Anyways, Marty knows what I'm talking about. What's her last name? Luna. Anyways, Luna. Luna Whitcomb. All right, thanks, Luna, for the awesome uh, link. Um, yes, she is awesome. Yes. Uh, so. Okay, I think we have this good now. Uh, she's the one that was uh, um, talking about treating powdery mildew with kombucha. Oh wow, yep. that helps them too. So this is, uh, and, and that's kombucha is lactobacillus, but it's also got a lot of sodium in it as well. So it's kind of acting in two different ways to kill the PM. But um, basically this is a great article that was posted uh, today that, that she posted, but it's uh, by our friend uh, Kevin McKernan over at Medicinal Genomics. He's been on the show a few times. In fact, early last year, he talked about, uh, um, you know, assays for the virus on cannabis products. So, um, but uh, uh, it, it's just a, a thing about how they, they're looking at terpene expression and how different bacteria groups are directly responsible for terpene expression and synthase. And without them present, those terpenes are not found. Right. So the, wow. if the plant isn't exposed to that bacteria, then it doesn't produce that terpene, essentially. Correct? Correct. Absolutely. And this just goes and backs up all of the stuff that Marty and I have been saying for years about the importance of dual root zones and terrestrial microbiomes and the production of <clears throat> maximizing terpene production. You know, if you want to have the maximum production, you have to have the most biodiverse root system possible that's non-pathogenic. And this just backs up all of that testing that we've done, but on a much more accurate, uh, detailed and genetic level uh, involving the exact uh, terpene synthase. But we've been able to observe this in a much more um, zoomed out way uh, uh, over, over yep. a long time. Yeah. That's a great article. Of course. Yeah, definitely something to check out on medicinalgenomics.com uh, slash microbes hyphen and hyphen terpenes. That's really cool. Yeah. And we already know from some of the testing that other people have done, um, you know, like the, the microbe testing they did when they were trying to prove that soil had a wider variety of uh, microbes and it came back like way the opposite. You know, the aquaponics had a much larger diversity and population than traditional soil, soil even living soil. So um, diversity wise, you have to include the water column to get that extra diversity, in my opinion. Sorry, I forgot where we're I'm just here. Water alert. what do I know? <laughs> Forgot we were sharing here. Uh, let me pull this back up. There we go. Close your porn, Steve. Oh! I didn't have any porn up. I just uh, <laughs> went, to check, went to click over to check chat and. Uh, <laughs> just fucking. I get uh, that. Got my friends. 
Um, so, anyways, it was super, super okay. interesting. And again, it's it's they they talk about uh, you know the breakdown. Right, let me pull it up here. It's super cool in the breakdown of the different bacteria uh, uh, that were found, and then on the where is it? Uh, one of these, yes, the exact terpene expression, which is super, super dope. And you can see the linalool is uh, super total. expressed. Huh? Well, I'm just reading the side percentage of total floral terpene emissions. And then those are all the different terpenes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so novice question looking at yeah. what you guys just posted and, and what you're talking about. My first question becomes, so what they are testing for is the ideal nutrient mix, correct? No, okay, so this what this did is, so this very first one, if you can see my screen and the mouse moving, uh -huh. this very first one is one that they fumigated with antibiotics, okay? So this doesn't have any, this is the fewest microbes possible on it, right? Sure. And then they then they had ones that they didn't spray with antibiotics, and you can see how there's a huge increase in terpene expression immensely compared to the controls. Almost all of these levels, uh, with the exception of trans uh, trans beta osamine, um, really were were hyper elevated. Okay, so those those are those like trichomes, or that is that what you're looking for as far as so these are the terpenes. Presentation of this is the, terp the terpenes and the flavors within the trichomes. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. It's like the flavor. You know, we talk about how concentrated THC doesn't taste like a lot. Like it's right. pretty tasteless because all the all the flavor comes from terpenes. So any anything you've smelled, anything you've tasted on um, weed, they're all terpenes. All right. Candy. So this screen that you have at the present moment is this talking about the, again, nutrient-rich, the binomes, is this the diversity? And then if it is a diversity, how do you create that diversity? So, so you create that diversity by doing beneficial inoculations. So things like IMO inoculations, indigenous microorganism inoculations, and um, probiotic products and, and things like that. So you breed different microbes and add them to your system. Right, you guys are bacteria plants, farmers. Yes. Right, I get that. Got to be partially bacteria farmers and create your soil, and but your soil is liquid, and you got the flow that comes. Okay, so if I go to Zimbabwe with you in your mind, I mean, well, in my mind with you, come on, Kakai, right? In my mind with you, um, a couple of questions I have. You're 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 indoors with the aquaponics. Do they have this access to the same materials as we do in America? I mean, I'm not trying to be condescending in any way, shape, or form, but with the the with the fluctuation in the uh, currency, I'm just not understanding or knowing how great the uh, underground market is able to give you the supplies that you need. And, and, and if you are dealing with outside conditions, how much of the outside environment do you have to mitigate before you can grow inside using aquaponics? Because you were just talking about how the pond was affecting the grow earlier. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, so, so with, so with oh, aquaponics, yeah. so with aquaponics, we can have both terrestrial microbiomes and aquatic microbiomes. And this is something I'm going to be talking about a lot more this year is uh, all of us are familiar with IMO collection. Um, uh, He's um, not. IMO, you're using vernacular. I just need you to catch me up with the vernacular. Indigenous micro. Indigenous microorganisms. Right. So the stuff that's so, already so the got local you. forest, local, 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 right. local. So we collect local. microbes from local soil that's producing quality plants. Correct. And we extend it. And forest micro so so uh, and then a, a plot uh, move you like it out yeah you stored it man you stored it in, uh, into for now right okay <laughs> all right 
<laughs> there you um, go. That was awesome. <laughs> All right. Okay, yeah, so we did. A, we, I don't hear nothing. Go ahead. We upgraded the internet out here, and it's been going in and out a little more often. But generally, it's better uh, it's than it been was. All right, so. till then, we're good. All right. But so we need to start. Um, we didn't hear anything on indigenous microorganisms. Sure. So indigenous microorganisms are locally, uh, local, locally collected uh, soil microbes, right? So it could be everything from compost, local, really good compost made from just your local area, or it could be IMO collection or whatever, like whatever your inoculant, you know, whatever your chosen style is, is fine, right? I'm not going to tell people that one is better than the other. I mean, I have my personal thoughts, but whatever works for you, you know, grow it, right? But um, uh, so utilizing or indigenous microorganisms and that type of stuff is something that definitely um, we're, we're expanding over a lot more and, and something I want to, to get out there a lot more, uh, especially with people like uh, over in Africa, you know, they can afford rice, sugar and milk for, you know, helping their plants grow. That's all affordable, right? That's well within their means, but they can't afford a lot of these fancy fertilizers or chemical pesticides or it's just not in their budget, man. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that kind of basic problems. They're so used to people having at least being able to get loans, farm loans, or, you know, just having access to resources that they just do not have a lot of these parts of the world having traveled a lot. And um, it's definitely something that I think really is going to be game changing. But um, well, to go back to the beginning part of that conversation was that I think, you know, it's something I'm be talking about a lot this year is aquatic IMO. I think that utilizing aquatic IMO collection is going to be as important as terrestrial IMO collection. Uh, so rather than just using rice to collect soil microbes, uh, we'll also use it to collect those mi mineralizing microbes in water uh, and, and utilizing the ones because the aquatic ones, about 75 plus minus percent of those will live in your soil. And you want to increase your biodiversity, don't you? I mean, we just talked about the study that, that fleshed that out, right? So let's dip into that pool. It's a whole pool of microbes that, that a lot of soil growers haven't even looked at trying to dip into to increase the soil microbe biodiversity in their own grows. You know, the, they might have IMO down, they might have the rest of it down, they might have their own compost down, but they're not hitting that resource that might be on their property, their pond, their lake, their stream can be a huge additional source of mineralizing microbes that they're not utilizing right now. It's something that I want to talk about a lot this year and we're doing some videos on it. And um, we'll be doing some a couple of different types of collections, and uh, including uh, you know everything from a uh, uh, you know rice collection to sponge collection to aquatic plant uh, uh, mash collection, which is more of almost like a Rodale method, uh, or not a Rodale method, but a, almost like a pseudo Rodale method for for collecting aquatic roots uh, and microbes off of those roots. Um, in, in an aquatic environment uh, and, and showing people how to utilize those both in aquatic and terrestrial growth. So if you're a, a soil grower or an aquatic grower, so that's definitely some of the new content that I've been working on and want to help, you know, get out there because it's, you know, this other resource that's just completely untapped, but something that anybody can afford to, to have access to, you know, it's not a, a huge barrier of entry in terms of technology or understanding even. Okay. Wonderful. That was about as clear as <laughs> okay, so my next my next question, forgive me. So when it comes down to the gap between what microbes could be imported or that, that would be external to the grow in Zimbabwe, what, what's that gap? What's the currency gap? Or is it a um, material gap, distribution gap? The biggest issue, the reason why we put the whole Zimbabwe grow on pause is because it's too damn hard for me to get resources to the farm. Right. That's what I, 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 it, yeah. it comes back to, I can't get pest. The, the ultimate reason is I can't get pest control agents to the farm right now. Right. right. Locked, with, right. They've had these repeated randomly declared lockdowns. I can't, what am I supposed to do if I'm on week five of flower? Right. Like right. I'm just effed. Right. Like right. I can't. <laughs> yes, you are. Correct. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's what you do. Like, well, just, right. that, 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 yeah. You know, there's a lot of stuff I can make organically. We talked about, uh, you know, integrate uh, IPMO, uh, which is um, indigenous predatory microorganisms, which we've talked about on the show before, and Chris Trump talked about on the show as well, um, uh, and uh, you know things like that. But I can't solve everything. Sometimes I just need the predator that eats the thing, right? And it's Correct. not from Africa or wherever. Right. So. I can get access to most of that through a couple of different big uh, operations in Africa and South Africa, I'm sorry. But um, I, 
I can't transport them. <laughs> I can't physically get them to the farm. And that became the huge issue. So until that thaws out a little bit and things stabilize with the global health situation, I think we're pretty much just going to kind of pause on Africa temporarily. Um, I, you know, until things thaw, because you, you, even if you have that all going and you, you harvest, it's, you know, almost impossible to move biomass right now it's hard to move anything sure. you know, even in a shipping container period right now um because of all the shit going on better yet trying to move a bunch of heavily restricted things that you need all the paperwork for right like right. it took me what was it like an extra month marty to get those seeds into zimbabwe that would just sat at customs and they just wanted the next paper and the next paper and the next paper and the next paper and the next paper until you know and we did that on the u.s side and then we did it in transit and then we did it again when it got to zim they wanted a new set of papers and just everybody wanted their own set of shit that they didn't tell you on when we sent them and even trying to do everything you know as right as we could we still got surprised and had to go grab new you know just get actual documentation for the stuff that we had and it was just a huge pain right so even when you do things right and then um yeah. And then just the fact that they've, again, they've changed the cannabis rules six different times since I've left. So it's like, I don't even know, honestly, what the current taxation rate is right now, because they've changed that three times. So yeah, I, that, that, well, yeah, that's also, okay. yeah, that's also a little bit of just Zimbabwe and just instability of the currency system. Well, and in Zimbabwe, a lot of Africa is interesting with the <laughs> currency because a lot of the currencies are digital only, right? So a lot of Africa does not have a cash currency, or if they do, there's not, a, it's not the main currency used in the true. country. So. True, 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 it's, true, true. You know, if you have, it's, it's definitely strange if you haven't been in that type of environment. It's, it's, it takes a bit to get used to, yeah? uh, but, uh, and then learning how to uh, juggle your currencies so you can, you know, sometimes make a couple extra bucks too, if you know how to trade up. Right? Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. So, or if you see some news coming down the pipeline, you can quick switch your currencies or whatever. Yes. My baby brother um, spent time out in Brazil and then um, in Vietnam. And so, yeah, I have a frame of reference for what it is that you're talking about. And so you are correct. I mean, it becomes a, absolute hassle to deal with multiple levels of governmental organizations that are trying to CYA and not assist with any of the actual GDP <laughs> of the, <laughs> for real, for real. They're not trying to facilitate any kind of growth on the ground and they're just basically feeding IMF and World Bank. But but anyway, I'm getting off topic. Well, it was pretty funny. We, we had a meeting with one of the one of the government officials there, and he's like, "Well, what if you did?" And I'm not, I, I'll be really vague with this, so I don't get anybody in trouble. But they're like, "What if you did X, Y, and Z size farm, like w with the government? Like, what if we no, asked you to do this size farm?" And, and and then I said, "Well, at that size, it would turn like whatever it was, 1.1 billion dollars a month or whatever it was." And it was like, right. "This one farm would make." as much as like half your mining industry like you not i don't think you can move all this though like Correct. you could grow it but like not it's you perfect. crash the market you'd be growing like four percent of the global population of cbd like right you know or some some ridiculous pop you know percentage of the global market in terms of tonnage like you can't just move that instantly so there's a lot of like logistics too and then you know, nobody thinks that anything grown in Africa internationally is up to standard, even though a lot of the times it is. A lot of times these places have never been anything but organic because they can't afford to put, bring anything with chemicals. So, you know, there's a lot of areas that really are pristine, really great growing areas. There's also, and this is something that I want to talk about sometime on the Future Cannabis Project when we do this, we're, we're working on putting together a Zimbabwe Grow episode with Peter and, and doing a, um, a, a couple pe different people that have all grown in Zimbabwe, myself included um and, and talk about you know growing in africa and stuff like that and um and this is something that i noticed big time in zimbabwe was the fact that um syngenta has a stranglehold on their entire agriculture industry they they are 95 to 98 percent of the agriculture products are brought in by syngenta uh also known as monsanto so um, their 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 current name is Syngenta, but it's Monsanto. Syngenta slash Monsanto, same thing. Um, and uh, 
So awesome. you have all, you know, they've been giving people their pest management plans and the NGOs and these, uh, you know, aid groups fund these, you know, Syngentas to go in and give them seed, give them pesticides, give them heavy metal laden fertilizers that prevent those growers from ever allowing that space to be used for cannabis because the bioaccumulation of the pesticides and the heavy metals, because this is the stuff that they were given for free or the government was given and donated or paid for by the US government or whoever, Europe or UN or whatever, that trying to feed these people, especially during the post Rhodesian days and during the, uh, uh, during the civil war that happened, uh, uh, they are, you know, they don't call it a civil war, but, um, uh, during the, uh, the hard times they had in the last 20 years, um, uh, you know, they, it's been, um, I mean, the ground's been poisoned in a lot of places. And also remember a lot of these were tobacco farms and they spread all kinds of, I mean, let's just to give you an example, I can buy a bottle of Paraquat in Zimbabwe, which is insane. You know, that's been pulled from the U.S. market for quite a long time. So you also have like, um, this is something else I'll never forget till the day I die. And then it creeped me out because it, it actually happened in Lebanon later uh, last year was uh, walking in and then seeing literally like a hundred by 200 foot square piled four pallets high of ammonium nitrate in the middle of a hardware store. It's going to pop. Yeah, I mean, it's the biggest fire hazard right, it's gonna pop. that right. you can think of all in one place what? in the center of the store in the middle of downtown Harare. And you're just like, yeah, no, I don't want to be anywhere near this building if there's ever a fire in this neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> like, box, anywhere, anywhere, yeah, anywhere. Any direction. Anywhere. Yeah, but literally, like, just seeing, like, multiple tractor trailer loads just all in one giant pile. <laughs> All in 50 pound bags, you know, just insanity, like just crazy stuff. So that was stuff that I'll, I'll never forget. Um, but we went around to like all the different pet. I remember we, we hit every single pest control place in Harare trying to find anything that we could use really. And we ended up just saying screw it and buying everything through South Africa because there literally is not any control agents in this, the whole country that's legally registered at least anywhere publicly for sale that I could find that was legally allowed to be used in the United States or Europe for, for cannabis production. So it was just, you know, we're going to stick to those standards. I don't care if I'm over there, we're growing healthy stuff, right? We're doing it for export anyway. Um, right. so. Okay. All right. So I got a question now, unless you got somebody from the chat. All right. So I like to switch and I'm from Alaska. If I go to the, um, South East, no, yeah, no, Southwest, I'm sorry, Southwest. As climate change occurs, <clears throat> we are anticipating, and I'm serious, we're anticipating uh, a more temperate zone in the subarctic around the 61st latitude. That means the Southeast should dry up. We've got 10,000 generations of observation of salmon bones that are in that area. So that means it's phosphorus rich, okay? If we wanted to develop that area terrestrial, like I love how you were saying that, would that, what what would we need to shift in, cause it'd be phosphorus rich, but it won't, I mean, it'll be like dominantly on that and what calcium, wouldn't it? I mean, tell me so, what we so would need to add or shift in order to try and make that into- so there's a there's really good documentation on nutrient transport in that particular exact environment. I know I've seen pretty cool and uh, charts on how the, a lot of those nutrients are being brought from the rivers by the salmon, by the, yes. and, and then the nitrogen yes. and phosphorus taken up the hill and, yes. and deposited. And then the tree is accumulating it, yes. storing it in the, in and then the bring area. it back down. Yeah. And then what rain brings it back down. Yeah. So, right. um, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's, and there's, a new, there's, I mean, they've done radioactive tracing all the way up to the ocean from, you know, hundreds of miles inland with, with that stuff and, and traced every single thing out. And there's multiple studies that have done that now, um, that you can find online. Uh, I don't know any off the top of my head, but. No, no, no. I, I, I have a couple of friends who are scientists. I can get access to all that. So then the question is, is, well, I mean, will we be able to like just scoop that up and be able to utilize that or being, or what, what do you do? 
Well, I mean, you would just maintain it like in a proper living soil and, you know, maybe set up hugel beds or you know, just do a more traditional organic, you know, long-term soil stability type thing, you okay. know, figure out, grow, grow um, bioaccumulators in your area that are going to be you know, able to supplement what the plants are pulling uh, to provide that okay. back. culture is those beds I was telling you about where you, you dig down and you put the wood material right. underneath so it'll soak up water, rainwater. So eventually over time, if you get enough rainwater in your area, they'll they'll water themselves almost year round. Okay. So you they're they're very water efficient because you use all that wood mass um, that starts breaking down. You use that wood mass breaks down into lots of uh, potassium, and then also gives you fungal spores, all kinds of good stuff. But also it becomes very spongy and will soak up a ton of water, and the plants grow down through the soil and soak up the water out of the wet. Spongy okay, wood. so once we lay down the logs, what do we layer it with? Oh, yeah, so you dig down and then you lay, usually you layer uh, your wood on the bottom, right? And then you put soil over the top of it and then cover the make like a mound. And sticks and, and twigs and then put your soil on top. Yep. Mm -hmm, yeah, so you start with your larger mass stuff. So like leaf litter um, sticks, smaller sticks and stuff like that. And then eventually you build up the soil and then you want to cover the whole, you make like a mound. So you want to round it on top and then uh, uh, cover the whole surface area with straw um, to help uh, keep it evaporation from happening. So by having the straw covering the whole top, you'll like any sunlight and anything keeps it all, keeps the soil very sealed, I guess, on top. So it's not evaporating as much and will um, stay wet. And, and so it grows it grows a lot of fungal networks inside of that core as well and that helps store a lot of the water especially in longer term you know the the biomass of that mushrooms can be tapped in exchange for water by the plants uh very readily so it holds that water up by the surface my friend cody i, I don't think you've met him yet but he has a couple of agriculture beds that this year is their third year in place and he didn't water them at all and grew vegetables and that like all kinds of stuff out of them you know, you know, you just plant them and they just grow year round. We had a question in chat. It goes, I've been year using aquatic, aquatic snails for biofilm and algae control. Also to provide feed to the fish. Turns out they're carriers of liver flukes. Yes, they are carriers of liver flukes. They can also, depending on what country you're in, also be, like when I was in Zimbabwe and Africa, South Africa, they can be carriers of schistomiasis. They can be carriers of... Uh, uh, a couple of different nasties. So generally we try to eliminate snails. Now, if you need to eliminate snails, you can use, um, you know, copper sulfate and give your plants a little extra copper than normal, um, you know, but still below fish threshold, depending on their species. It's one option. Uh, alternatively, which is not a great option, but it's an option and as, as a last resort. Um, your other great option is um, you can use what they call planariate killer uh, or fluke killer. Um, it's made from beetle nut extract, the same uh, stuff that the guys um, the, in Southeast Asia get all, you know, crackhead on and, and wear their teeth out and get all black, black teeth and shit. Um, that same exact tree um, is very fish safe. In fact, it's so uh, safe, uh, safe for most things that you can use, utilize it at the right dosage with shrimp, coral, anemones, and other incredibly sensitive organisms. Um, it just kills um, those, uh, you know, nematodes, it's a nemicide, right? So um, you can utilize it to kill off just those. But again, you got to be real careful with what you use it with. It kills some things, it doesn't kill others, but most things that aren't just completely soft bodied, uh, it, it won't kill. Um, but there are a few exceptions. So do your research. But uh, in aquaponics, it's something that you can utilize that's not going to, you know, screw with your plants or screw up your cycle or, you know, provide anything that's going to be, you know, any type of danger to humans. Um, you know, uh, in terms of bioaccumulation, it, it's not very active very long in the water to begin with. So it breaks down very rapidly and, and you know, goes away pretty quick. Yeah, um, that uh, Pyramid Pure Foods in the, in the chat there, he actually uh, sold me my first set of barrels, which I still have, by the way, uh, for when I built a bigger aquaponics system. And he's, he's had a, a local aquaponics grow here uh, for a while. So shout out to Drew. Thanks for showing up and chatting in, buddy. Nice. Uh, uh, American once has done some gorilla growing, did it great, and we're botrytis resistant. 
Yeah, Botrytis is definitely a big issue. We're seeing just an ungodly amount in Oklahoma, but people just not used to the grow conditions here. All right. Um, just looking for other questions here in chat. Oh. Oh, yeah. Do you ever... Do you have another uh, question at the moment while I'm reading here? Can't get beneficial oh. insects in Oklahoma DOA. Uh, I haven't had that issue. We've had really good luck with um, uh, Arbico Organics. I've also had good luck with Biobi uh, and with, um, there's another one. There's the other, uh, Rupert or Cooper, Cooper. I've had good luck with Cooper as well in Oklahoma, so. But uh, Arbico Organic seems to be the best, especially if we're doing any kind of larger order. They're they're usually over an item. Uh, all, all the ones that require overnight, they are they make you ship overnight. So, um, you know they they won't let you kill your bugs on purpose. That's one of the things I like about Arbico is that you know you can't select ground shipping for something that needs overnight or it's going to die. And they always get shipped with like a cold pack usually is what it is. And so basically if your shipping takes longer than that cold pack and stay cold, then odds are you're, you're gonna end up with some dead bugs instead of live ones by the time you get there. Maybe not beneficial nematodes, but you know, any of your live like predators for sure, they require being overnight. Uh, sorry, I'm just scrolling through and trying to find some other questions. Um, all right. Well, does anybody have any other questions in the chat where we're going? Uh, I guess I had kind of a, an off kilter episode today. My whole day has been pretty wacky. So this whole week has been wacky. Uh, yesterday was quite the circus to watch for sure. Well, I was just going to give compliments. I mean, I think I just learned a whole lot. So thank y'all. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say on that front. And I'm really impressed by the work that you're doing um, internationally. Um, and, and, and I greatly appreciate that because when it comes down to real cultivation of economy that works at the local level, anything that isn't at the ground doesn't benefit the immediate people. It gets, gets filtered in by the bureaucratic hands or the corruption hands or greasy, you know, you already know. Um, so I greatly appreciate you actually being able to take care of people where they are and, um, inspiring change in a way that I dream of, but I don't have the reach to do. Um, also, yeah. Yeah. Yet. Yeah, you're correct. Yeah, <laughs> correct, correct. Yeah, because I do dream of the NGO and that becomes I mean, a very functional way of tapping into international markets. Herb is a very functional way of providing a cash crop that gives people and pathway to freedom. So, and mental, that, and, uh -huh. and mental health. True. Well, and all health. the benefits that come with growing mm -hmm. medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, yes, you've got the. Well, um, and paying your bills is mental health, too. We were just talking about that the other day, too. Right? <laughs> your bills are paid. That helps. True. You feel true. better. True. And having resources oh. to be able to dream with. Before I forget, I want to give these guys a shout out. This is one of the new thing I got, which I really like using in the garden. It's just these uh, cool little. Uh, yeah, put them up for the camera. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm oh, it <laughs> so it's a face mask. You can use it as a face mask, or what I like to use it in, in the garden for is more uh, like a tool for my long hair, keep it out of my face. And uh, so it's super easy. Slides on, they're real cheap. They're handmade out of, I forget where they're out of, the place is called Pings Apparel. So you can check them out online at Pings Apparel, Instagram. I forget where she's from, I apologize. But uh, most of the stuff, her products, she donates a lot of it to um, uh, different real people with real issues, which is great. <laughs> no fake charities, you know. Um, and they're, they're great, super soft. It's the thin micron, so you can use them as a legit face mask. Um, and then <clears throat> this is what I like to, you know, use it for in the garden, especially doing clones or moving stuff around. It just keeps all my hair out of my face. So if you've got long hair, definitely check them out at, at Things Apparel. Cool stuff. Also, uh, shout out Future Cannabis Project 2. FC, was it FCP2, I think is the YouTube channel. 
uh, just did the uh, show with them on um, talking about South Africa and African growing. We're going to do one just on Zoom soon. Uh, and then um, also shout out to Jordan at the um, Growcast. We just did an episode with him. Oh, yeah. He just released that on Monday. Uh, so uh, definitely check that out. Uh, it's a great episode. Uh, I believe it's their most recent episode over there. So definitely go check that out. Uh, Marty and I were both on that episode. Uh, I don't think we've done a third party. Jo oh, no, we did uh, our Embracing Organics. I think is the only other joint. Uh... Yeah, we did Embracing Organics and we did Do Grow Show. Oh, yeah, we both wait, Maybe we did it separately. I think we, we, yeah, we did it separately. Did, yeah, we did it separately, though. That's right. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, uh, all of their cool dudes. Check out all their channels. That's definitely cool. Yeah. Oh, and uh, I just started my LED grow off. So I have my um, uh, Bloom Plus uh, provided me with a BP3000, uh, which has been a great light. Had it up not too long yet, uh, almost two weeks. Uh, and so I have pictures going up to the Aquaponic Facebook Growers Group and video updates to my YouTube. Uh, on that one and also the Mars Hydro SP150, uh, which is 150 watt light, and hopefully getting in a couple other models of LEDs, um, so you can check that out. So, um, and shout out to both Mars Hydro and Bloom Plus, who were uh, incredibly flexible with being patient as we dealt with uh, fires and COVID and all kinds of other shit. Uh, they were very patient <laughs> for me to get this grow off going. Uh, and I appreciate it. And there are two other vendors that are, are trying to get lights to me and are just struggling also because of the exact same COVID issue. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll get them on soon. We'll be in perpetual flower from here on out. So we'll just be able, when we get them, we'll throw them up just like I did this time. I, you know, there's no place in my grow room where I can put up a new light that's not over an existing plant. So <laughs> They are finishing up some plants that are in there right now. Um, and I also put new plants in right next to those. So those are starting flower now. And we'll get to see multiple cycles under these lights, not, not just this one. So there's a little confusion in the Facebook group uh, about <laughs> why they were, you know, switched out partway through. I just don't have room. I, there's nowhere I can put a light that's not over a plant <laughs> at this point. So uh, that's why they're finishing up. Uh, the ones that are there now, but that, uh, that grow off is starting shout out to both of those companies. Um, check those out. If you're interested in LEDs, um, uh, it's obviously a hot topic as of late. So, um, we'll be getting more LEDs out to test. Especially with California requiring LEDs for all grows now as of January right. 1st. We warned so, you a long time ago. Yeah. We told you it was coming it. like three years ago. Well, I think we talked about it on the podcast. So, um, so we had another question in chat is, uh, Poem Ponics, is flowering time optimization a thing? I've heard lowering flowering times to increase phenotypic diversity, DJ short, but what about it increasing time? Uh, so I have seen and personally experienced, uh, mainly with color and then like increasing some of the unique terps. Uh, doing things under, you know, an 11 or 11 and a half hour instead of a 12 or even starting at 12 and decreasing down to like a 10 and a half at the end of flower and just taking, you know, a minute or two off each day um, is also, you know, something else that certain strains, especially if you wanted to finish the fuck up, you know, strains that just take too damn long um, is a great way to help speed them the hell up. You know, they think the day is getting shorter. They start, you know, the plant starts to say, all right, well, we gotta, we're going to get this moving then. Um, and it definitely helps, you know, increase the and shorten the times on them a little bit. But, you know, I, there's people that are far smarter than I am that have done breakdowns on this. I think uh, Shango or Kevin Jodry, one of the two of them, did a long talk about this. I know, I don't remember which two. Some of these conferences kind of all blur together. Um, <laughs> uh, he said if he hits his bong aid more. Time. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Last year, I think I did night. What was it 2019 I did like was it 20 yeah 2019 I had done like 19 shows by 420 or some shit or 20 wow. shows by 420. yeah are you going through like convention withdrawal like do you feel like you need to yeah like I've been sitting at home far too long and yeah no I actually have a whole <laughs> bunch of conferences that if they actually do them I will be speaking at across the south this year uh, and uh, a couple of and internationally again, if they happen, um, we'll see. Uh, I'm I'm very much 
personally think I think this year is going to be not too much different than last year. I think they're going to keep having these new strains that are going to keep screwing shit up. But <clears throat> hopefully, I'm wrong, right? So no, you know, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Do especially, especially with the way things have gone with with Britain and South Africa lately, I think it's it's no bueno. But uh, uh, yeah, so um, I guess that would be my thing. Is that you know what? Experiment with it. But I, you know, I, I don't think that the yield difference and the potency difference really is all that different. Um, the biggest difference I would say would to to do change up your times would be to uh, speed up those longer flowering times. Um, the other one that I would uh, also um, suggest, and this is something that I'm real curious on. I've seen some people talk about trying to do this, and it's something that. There's a few old school articles. I know I remember first read, read about this on Overgrow. Uh, if you guys remember Overgrow uh, is doing um, like an 18 hour day and then a 12 hour night, like giving them 12 or 14 hours of nighttime, but real long days too. So pushing the days real long and the nights real long and, and you know, seeing what type of growth that does. And I haven't seen any type of conclusive, there's a bunch of anecdotal stuff and, and old stuff but i haven't seen anyone actually do that with you know heavy documentation if someone knows of one uh, please post in the comments um uh, it'd be I've great to it check the other out. way i've shortened days before and i and i still do that in sort of i guess in my in my bedroom right and just interrupt the night cycle you know with an hour of light and and then turn it back off which is similar but um, you can all, you know, like you're talking about doing shorter days, like 20 hour days, as opposed to 24 hour days. Um, what do they call it? Like the gas lantern schedule or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and I've ran, um, I've ran 11 hour, uh, I've ran 11, 13. So I've ran 11 hour light and 13 hours dark before. And I, it seems to be better for, um, like indica dominant strains, in my opinion, like they seem to, to like a little bit shorter days. Um, so I did my last run that way. I went back to 12 hours this time and I feel like the last run was better. So I'm going to switch back to it. I already switched back to 11 hours for the finish this time. Hmm. Wow. So le less light. So I think that probably depends on somewhat on your lighting source. Like if you have a, a weaker light, you know, it's not putting out as much uh, power, then a, a longer day might be more beneficial. You might need longer than the 12 hours to get the total amount that you need in a daytime. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. So we had uh, another question. What is the best, hold on, where is this? Uh, I gotta get a grow room monitor with CO2 sensor. Any suggestions? Uh, and then what well, somebody else in chat said Pulse Pro, um, that's probably, I guess, the easiest off the shelf one that I would recommend. I think Marty has got a lot of experience in the, uh, the automation field. In fact, you, you talked about it quite a bit in the past. Do you want to you have a better suggestion? I don't have a better one. That's probably the common one um, that you'll see pop up a lot. Uh, you'll find them in, in a lot of the integrated controllers. Usually if you're doing CO2, you should probably also be doing other environmental stuff. So you know, having ones that are uh, integrated are my preference instead of separate sensors for each one, but some of those get expensive. So it just kind of depends on, like if you want just a CO2 monitor, then that's, you know, that's probably what I would go with. But there, um, there are definitely ones that uh, you can get where they'll, um, there'll be a whole panel of things. So you'll be able to do, you know, CO2, temperature, humidity, all kinds of environmental controls specifically for growing. So you can look at those more integrated ones if you're on a larger scale, but like if you already have stuff, like if you're a lot of times, if you're just growing into and needing CO2, you might already have solutions for temperature and humidity and stuff that you're trying to add CO2 on. So that would be a great add on hmm. to just add CO2 on by itself. If that makes sense. And there's Wi-Fi, uh, based modules as well so that you can have you know integrated software that track them so like for i don't do co2 so I, I i'm not tracking it or measuring it here but for my other environmental stuff i have a weather station that i just put the sensors inside and then use their software to track the data 24 7 so 
I can go to any point in time you know, and say, okay, last Tuesday at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, this was the temperature and humidity in the grow room. And then I have software that, that looks at those logs and decides when to turn on my fans, my input or my exhaust fans to control the humidity. And then you can get more complicated than that if you want to do like scheduling and stuff. Once you get into the programming realm, like you can say, oh, well, I want it to be, I want the exhaust fan to kick on if the humidity goes over uh, 80% or uh, over 90 degrees te in temperature. So you can have multiple conditions control the same fan if you have it in, in a software controlled environment versus those things controlled individually. It can be more problematic to wire them up. You probably, a lot of people just have to hire a professional to do all of that. Whereas if you, in the software world, you can control it with, with software. You can, have, you can have the same sensor or sensors uh, control the same fan. So it's just kind of nice. Mm. Oh, you can make them smart too. Like I can tell, uh, I can tell my Google home or my smartphone, I can be like, hey, Google, turn on the flower room exhaust fan and it'll kick on. <laughs> that might be overboard. I don't know. Man, that's 21st century flash Gordon stock, man. Someone says, don't forget to get your mask for your plants if you're in Cali. <laughs> Cali. Get a mask for their plant. Yeah, uh, I'm not. I'm not poo pooing masks. I'm just saying, uh, Cali has gone a little draconian. A little. Um, here we go. What else Somebody we said go? that the only hope for Cali to get rid of COVID is for that big earthquake to finally hit and they all fall in the ocean. Damn! <laughs> I didn't say wow. that. Marty did. Send your send wow. your fan <laughs> mail to uh, AP Meds <laughs> at Gmail. <laughs> I mean, what's it like one in five now? Right. It is bad. Well, actually, the worst one is actually uh, in terms of potential is the Cascadian subbolt, which is up in Washington and Seattle. That's the one that when it goes would be the biggest one. Well, anyways, that, that's not as funny though. I'm just still just as terrifying. Well, um, I have to go put my daughter to bed, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you with Kokai. You guys can can close it out. Okay. Uh, Do you want to tell everybody how to find you? We're about to wrap up the show anyway. Yeah, you can find me at AP Meds on Instagram, on uh, YouTube. Uh, you can find me in the Aquaponic Cannabis Growers Group on Facebook and uh, Patreon at AP Meds. All of, all of those social medias. Um, and then uh, you've also been doing a lot of uh, uploading work on the class too, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So we're all the way through day one on the class, which is like, uh, you know, eight plus hours of content. Um, I don't even know how many slides. Um, but so day day one of three is complete and we'll be blowing through day two. I'm about halfway through editing day two um, and getting those uploaded. So uh, looking forward to doing that. So shout out to everybody on Teachable. We appreciate all that and your patience as we get all of that uploaded and complete. It is just a lot to get going. So, um, you know, as we've been talking about <laughs> for, I think we took us about a year to like get it all filmed and together and get our schedules to line up and everything else. So it, it's a lot in the making and there's a lot there, but we're just trying to get it all up there. And then we can start on the on the new content. We're going to start doing the whiteboard sessions and um, start focusing on some of the stuff to develop and, and put up all the stuff that we're doing in between now. There's even new stuff since we filmed it in the beginning of last year. There's new stuff that we recorded over because it took us so long to get the class all together that we had new stuff to put in. So the more we put it off, the more it becomes the problem. So we're getting everything shoved up as fast as we can. And then once we get onto this format, it's going to be a lot easier to pace it and just make content as we go and just kind of stay on Teachable for our main platform. So that's going to be exciting uh, moving on. 
Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be able to put a ton of content. We have we're we'll gonna be doing this one, then we'll do the um, advanced aquaponics class, and then we'll do the uh, medicinal herb class after that. In terms of getting the content up, we have a, a ton of uh, of education in the pipeline for 2021. Basically, stuff for, for the whole rest of the year in terms of classes and that and stuff we're gonna be putting out. So uh, it'll be awesome. And then we're also gonna be doing regular content updates for the class. If you get the class, um, you're gonna get the first uh, 600. Uh, 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 lectures that come with the base class. And then we're going to be adding new, new additional lectures, build outs, farm tours. Uh, I know we're going to be doing a tour of um, Vertica soon. Uh, they, their stuff is, is really on point up there. We're going to be doing a tour of their grow uh, and a couple of others um, uh, in the area and a couple of others internationally. And then uh, also across the country, we're going to be doing some cool filming uh, and some neat stuff that we're going to be working on. So um, definitely something to check out in the future. And um, uh, something to be looking for for this year. You know, we have a ton of content lined up for you guys, and uh, we're really excited to do it. I know I've been editing up the last of day two of the conference. We'll be releasing those out on Wednesdays, uh, and then after that, we'll be doing some new series. We have, uh, I know I have a couple of different smaller aquaponic systems, and we're going to be building some some Home Depot style aquaponic systems and some other stuff for the house uh, here, and just trying to show people, you know, some tinier systems. I get tons of questions about them, and uh, while it's not my favorite cup of tea um y'all keep asking about it so we're going to grow some so that's what we'll be doing so um thanks a lot for watching you can find me at potent phonics um thanks for joining us today buddy uh watch uh, uh do you do any uh public uh media stuff or not really <laughs> yeah the last thing i was in was called usa today and there were 1.39 million copies distributed across 50 states so yeah a little bit <laughs> nice. Please. All right. Well, uh, if you have anything you want to plug, feel free. If not, uh, we'll oh, we, okay. Yeah. So when it comes down to that, then we'd be the Ashland Beepock Sanctuary, which is um, a community that's forming in order to fortify uh, people in Southern Oregon, uh, as well as allow a solution to the tension that we're dealing with in our country at the present moment by providing a pathway towards greater humanity, those bridges, and figuring out how to craft that medicine so that we don't feel as much pain as we would feel if we just tried to crash through it individual by individual, it's better to do it as a group with help than not. So we use a lot of medicine within my community in order to mitigate the anxiety and depression that comes with being in an area that might be hostile to your existence at times. So it's get better, it gets better. Um, and uh, we are a, again, like I just said, you know, a firm believer in the usage. And so I am very impressed by what you guys have built and the way that you're able to communicate to a variety of persons how to grow what we all want to have access to at you know, their benefit. So thank you, thank you. And it's nice like meeting you for the first time. You're like a cool ass cat. <laughs> Thanks, it was very fun to have you on uh, and, and to have uh, have to explain some stuff that may, you know, that we're hyper used to just glossing over. Um, that maybe some of the newer listeners haven't had a chance to be exposed to. So it definitely helps them as well. So thanks for, thanks for that. Thank you, um, thank you. Yeah. We had a question in chat. It says, what about possible phenotype expression from seed? If you have striped red seeds and solid blue seeds, you could end up with striped, solid, and dappled purple seeds. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of ridiculous stuff claimed about seeds and seed stripes, seed shape, seed form, um, the size of the seeds. As far as I can tell, all of it's BS. Um, I have giant seeds that have little plants. I have little seeds that have giant plants. 
I have dark seeds, light seeds. Now I would say white seeds are not very good. Usually those are immature, but aside from that, you know, um, that's really probably the only thing I would say about seeds, but um, it's it just almost like a micro phenotypic variation that, you know, I haven't seen any evidence for any court. Now I could be wrong on that, but I don't know. I haven't seen any evidence for it, nor have I seen any correlation in my own experience. Hopefully that answers your question. Alrighty, everyone, uh, it's getting late. Uh, I'm gonna go to bed, it's been a long freaking day. Um, check us out at uh, Growcast. Uh, I'm not Growcast. Well, yeah, Growcast or just on Jordan's show. Sorry, I'm beat. Um, uh, you check us out at Potent Ponics, SoundCloud, iTunes. Uh, Spotify, all the places, uh, or Growing with Fishes podcast. Um, we will be back next week. Uh, we will ha be having uh, a couple of cool people on. We got some um, biologists, some, uh, yeah, a bunch of other awesome people uh, that are going to be coming on the show. So um, we'll see you guys again soon.